With nearly 15 million members, the Southern Baptist Convention is the largest Protestant denomination in the United States. Now it is facing a reckoning of its own over sexual abuse. A Houston Chronicle investigation found hundreds of clergy or staff allegedly committed abuse or misconduct over two decades. This week, delegates of Southern Baptist churches approved changes for the first time to make it easier to expel churches that cover up sexual abuse cases. Rachel Den Hollander was the first woman to publicly accuse Larry Nasser. He's the former sports doctor at Michigan State University who was convicted of assaulting multiple girls and women. Den Hollander spoke at the convention on a panel with fellow sexual abuse survivors and is on the denomination sex abuse study group. She's also the author of what is a girl worth? My story breaking the silence and exposing the truth about Larry Nasser and USA Gymnastics. Rachel Den Hollander, thank you very much for being with us. So you, we know now that the church uh, has made these changes. You've been talking to a number of survivors. I want to understand what your sense is of just how widespread this abuse was. Well, you know, unfortunately, the Houston Chronicle article didn't reveal anything that survivors and advocates haven't known for a long time, uh, and that is that we have a severe problem in Protestant circles with sexual abuse, uh, not just by pastors, uh, but by members of the church, uh, and a severe problem with how churches frequently handle disclosures of abuse. Uh, the top Protestant insurance companies receive more claims of sexual abuse by clergy than even the Catholic insurance companies uh, receive, and the number one reason that Protestant organizations have been held liable in federal court uh, for more than a decade is, with, is for the issue of sexual abuse. Um, so this has not come as a surprise to survivors and advocates. You have said uh, on your own that you believe that the church, in your experience, has not provided uh, the kind of support, the relief to uh, survivors of sexual abuse that it could. What do you base that belief on? Uh, well, again, we see the numbers uh, in terms of the rate of abuse. Uh, we see the numbers in terms of how many churches are found liable for mishandling sexual assault claims. And in addition to that, uh, the survivor community uh, has repeatedly said that the church has unfortunately been one of the worst places to go. Uh, in a recent survey that, uh, that asked survivors uh, what they thought would be the most helpful uh, versus what actually ended up being the most helpful, churches were listed uh, as one of, the thing, one of the institutions thought to be the most helpful until survivors went for help. Uh, and when survivors actually went for help, unfortunately, churches ranked dead last uh, behind the option of other. Uh, and so, unfortunately, again, this is, this is not a problem that is new to survivors and advocates. In your own experience, has that been the case? I have uh, received both ends of the spectrum. I was abused uh, in a church setting when I was seven years old, um, and I have, I have had very negative experiences with the church. I have also had very positive experiences with the church. Uh, and so my hope is that as the SBC is moving forward with these reforms uh, and with a growing awareness of the problem, um, that more and more survivors will be able to experience uh, the help and the comfort in the community that I experienced from one of my churches. And so these changes that were voted on uh, by the Southern Baptist Convention, the SBC, uh, to require churches to, in, in, in effect, to, to require more disclosure, uh, to ask the churches to step up to do more, are these the kinds of changes that you think are going to make a difference? I think these are absolutely the first steps that need to be taken. Uh, you know, one of, one of the critical steps that the SBC took uh, was to amend the Constitution to uh, create a credentialing committee who can examine claims of abuse and of churches mishandling abuse. Uh, and this is critical because that provides greater transparency, greater accountability, and it puts the framework in place uh, as we've never had before for being able to deal with these claims. Uh, the curriculum that has been put together to help equip churches on the journey uh, towards understanding abuse and being able to both prevent and respond respond to it uh, is a critical first step. Uh, that being said, again, survivors and advocates are aware that this is a first step only. The frame and the foundation is going to be only as good as what's built upon it. Uh, and so my hope is that as the SBC moves forward, they will build upon this solid frame and foundation. It's my understanding that at the same time you've said that some in the Southern Baptist Convention are undermining these changes, um, that they were clearing some of the local churches that should have been uh, uh, punished, should have been reprimanded. Why, why did you make that statement? 
Uh, well, unfortunately, that's a matter of public record. Uh, the SBC president, J.D. Greer, uh, had put forward um, a, a list of churches that he believed uh, merited closer scrutiny for how they had handled sexual abuse claims. Uh, but within a matter of days, the SBC's executive committee, who is in charge uh, of doing that investigation, cleared seven out of those 10 churches without talking to survivors, uh, and unfortunately did so on a four-pronged basis uh, that was uh, almost useless in evaluating whether churches mishandle abuse. Uh, and advocates and survivors uh, and experts in the field of abuse uh, could have explained to the executive committee uh, that those four prongs that they were using to evaluate uh, were not the correct standards to be using. Uh, they were not helpful guidelines to be using. Uh, but unfortunately, expert uh, advice was not sought. Uh, you know, and so why that was done, uh, I think, is something that the executive committee needs to wrestle with. I believe there are some in the executive committee that uh, made those decisions uh, out of ignorance. Uh, they simply didn't know. Um, and there were some that made those decisions knowing uh, that, that those criteria they established uh, were not helpful and useful criteria. So unfortunately, we have seen uh, efforts to undermine uh, what is being done in the SBC. Uh, that being said, the steps that were taken today by the majority of SBC messengers, I think, are very positive, and so I am hopeful. And, and that's what I wanted to ask you, if you overall still have confidence that it's moving in the right direction. I do want to uh, bring us back to, to Michigan State uh, University, because today, as we reported earlier, the former dean, who was also the boss of, of Dr. Larry Nasser, was convicted. He himself has now been convicted of criminal conduct, neglect of duty, uh, acquitted of criminal sexual misconduct, though, but he could still face up to years, uh, up to five years in prison. What's your reaction to all this? Uh, you know, Dean Strample's negligence in supervising Larry, his deliberate return, uh, putting Larry back in the office uh, when he was under police investigation, uh, is something that we've known for quite a long time. So I am grateful to see the conviction uh, for, uh, for that conduct. I think it is necessary and I think it is just. I am disappointed and discouraged uh, to see that the survivors who reported assault by Strample, uh, by Dean Strample himself, were not believed by the jury uh, because we know we understand what Dr. Strample's conduct was. His personnel file was full of warnings about his predatory behavior. Uh, and so I am disappointed to see a jury acquittal on that count. More broadly speaking, Rachel Den Hollander, we know that a lot has happened since you initially came forward uh, to be the first person to accuse uh, Dr. Nasser. We know that a number of institutions have made changes as a result of the disclosures by you and so many other, so many other women. Uh, who, who suffered sexual abuse. What do you think it all adds up to? Do you think things have changed enough? What, it, what do you think has been done right, and what more do you think needs to be done? Now, I think there is an extent to which we overestimate the change that has been made, honestly, uh, because where the, where the real test comes is how we respond when it's in our own community. How do we respond when it's our university? when it's our favorite sports team, our favorite coach, when it's in our religious institution or it's our political candidate, when it would cost something to care. And by and large, uh, we are still seeing a circling of the wagons. Uh, the statistics on the ability to convict sex offenders have not shifted. Uh, we see an excellent case of this with the University of uh, Southern California, USC, where uh, a gynecologist at USC, Dr. George Tyndall, has had over 500 women report sexual abuse. There are decades uh, of evidence of nurses reporting Dr. Tyndall's conduct, and yet there has not been a single criminal charge filed in his case. Uh, so the, the idea that we've had a massive cultural shift that makes it easy for survivors to speak up and easy to get justice, uh, that's simply not accurate. We have a great deal of work left to do, and it starts with how we respond when it's in our own community. Very discouraging, but very important to hear. Rachel Den Hollander, thank you very much. Thank you. And for the record, we invited J.D. Greer, who's the president of the Southern Baptist Convention, to join us for an interview. He declined our request at this time. And tonight, U.S. Roman Catholic bishops voted to create a new national hotline for reporting sex abuse allegations. It would be run by an independent group who would relay claims of abuse to regional supervisory bishops. The service is supposed to begin operating within a year.